Good morning, everybody. Good morning. A very warm welcome um, to this session on GDPR. Um, I think although we're going to cover off intros in a second, I'll introduce myself first so you know who I am. Um, so I'm going to be um, kind of keeping us to time and keeping us moving uh, today. There's quite a few people. We're going to encourage you, probably for the first time ever in a GDPR session, if you've been to them before, normally um, somebody talks at you from the front and you feverishly scribble things down and try and remember everything you want to ask at the end. So we're not going to do it that way. How we're going to do it is we're going to let you interact with the panel all the way through. Okay. Utterly terrifying for us, but really, really good for you. No, no, I jest. Um, so um, we've got a lot of views represented at the front of the room today, and we'll say we'll do those introductions first. So um, me first, though. Uh, my name is Ian Sherritt. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for a local company called SCC. Um, so I'm kind of representing the executive view today um, as part of the panel. Okay, So that senior person who you know, understands part of the legislation but has a business to run and some thoughts and some concerns. So I'm going to be representing that view and kind of reflecting out that view, and we have several other views as well. So I'm going to get the panel to introduce themselves so you know who's sitting in front of you, and you also know then who to write a one down for and when you score us and who to write a ten down for when you score us. And I have a bacon sandwich here, probably the last one, so if anyone... <laughs> So, um, Charlie, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Hello, everybody. Um, so, my name is Charlie Cornish. I manage uh, a portion of the professional services department within SEC. Now, that's a technology part of the IT industry. So, that's looking at pre sales and post sales for IT systems. So, I'll be giving the IT view uh, how IT needs to be looked after when it comes to GDPR and how IT can help you get some element of GDPR compliance. Thank you, Charlie. And then um, next is uh, Stuart, actually. Um, so, Stuart, do you want to introduce yourself and explain what you're representing today? Good morning. Um, so, I'm Stuart Pomfret. So, I, I head up software asset management services as part of a wider IT asset management service portfolio, SEC. So, it's about um, the role of asset management and obviously data being an asset, but primarily the kind of precursor to data which is where the assets are and what's on it and what data is held there and the interaction between that. Great, thank you, Stuart. Um, and then I'll get our legal counsel to explain who they are as well. So we'll start with you, Chris. Um, so I'm Chris Bridges. I'm a solicitor at Owen Mitchell. Um, I specialise in IT and data protection. Um, so my life is becoming more and more about GDPR. Um, and then I'll and Charlotte, yeah. Hi, I'm Charlotte Avery. I am in the commercial team at Owen Mitchell. And again, I'm kind of seeing a lot more GDPR, but I deal with it more in terms of supplier contracts and making sure that Article 28 is picked up. Thank you, Charlotte. And now we're going to spend the next 90 minutes in getting you to introduce yourselves to us. <laughs> so look, thank you for coming. Um, just a quick show of hands on a couple of things would be really helpful for us. Um, how many people uh, work for businesses or own businesses with less than 20 people working for them today in the room? Okay, a good proportion of you. That just gives us a flavour, so I'm assuming you're all here because you're worried about what that impact looks like on you as a relatively small organisation, would, would that be fair to say generally? So second question, how much have you already looked at the legislation or reports about the legislation or news on the legislation? Um, would you say a lot? How many people have looked at it? A great deal. Okay, how many people have come here to understand what the impact could be for them? Good, that tells us exactly what we need to do this morning, and that's fine. Good, I'm glad, because we all feel a lot more relaxed now we know why you're all here, which is good. So look, I think, from my perspective, what today is about is, is your, your interaction. So we'll go, uh, we'll keep going. So if you don't ask us questions, we won't stop. I didn't mean that literally. Uh, if you don't ask us questions, we'll continue to talk to you. However, if you do start to ask us questions, then I will make sure we spend an appropriate amount of time on that subject and that you don't all get bored and we don't get kind of bogged down in the, in the, in the weeds. Okay, so here we go. So the way I'm going to work this is I'm going to do a very brief introduction and then I'm going to ask the panel for their views um, for pretty much each slide. So we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to walk through it nice and slowly, okay? You're welcome to the deck afterwards, although there isn't much in the deck apart from a few bullet and aid memoirs, but we have a second deck which has some of the detail in it, which you're also welcome to. And also, both published by Owen Mitchell, there are two really, really good pamphlets at the front of the room um, on GDPR and what it could mean. One 
Um, it's a YouGov based one and the other one not, but nonetheless, you're welcome to take either of those if you want to. There are, is that all we have, Charlotte? That is okay, so um, that you'll be fighting for those later, probably. Right, so GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, is largely it's, it's, it's a reform of the existing um, laws around data protection. Okay. Um, the whole idea of it, I think, is to give some synergy right across Europe, frankly, so that it's the same wherever you are. But I think some of the challenges around this are people understanding what it applies to. And it applies to personally identifiable information, information that can identify me as an individual. Okay. Um, and fundamentally what that means is if you're doing anything with my data, um, then that information is subject to the regulations of GDPR. What you're doing with it, how you're processing my data, what you're using it to do, fundamentally. Um, and actually, before we all get really, really terrified about this, most of the concepts in GDPR are not new. Okay? It's about the appropriateness of dealing with personal information. Okay? So I'm going to get the kind of legal view first, if I can, just on that general, what it's about. So if you, Chris, want to just give it 30 seconds on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'll just reiterate that point. That it's really, it, well, we're calling it an evolution, not a revolution. Um, all of the, the GDPR generally is building on existing concepts. Um, and in the most part, it's not trying to stop you doing anything. It's just trying to make you put tighter restraints around what you're doing and um, tighter procedures, etc., to make sure that what you're doing is proportionate to the risk to individuals. Um, and uh, the, the other thing, <coughs> that, to, to put it in context, so the Data Protection Act, um, 1998, was written pre-commercial internet. Um, so the GDPR is really just trying to bring the data protection <coughs> legislation up to date across Europe uh, to reflect technology. So just a quick question on that, if I may, to the audience. How many of you rely heavily now on either web presence or apps or other things to communicate with your customers? Okay, wow. So that, that is the change, isn't it? I think for everybody, probably that's in where lies a lot of the concern. Um, so, Charlie, have you got you know extended view on that? I know we're very early days at the moment, but it's important to get everyone's view on this from a technology standpoint. Please. So from a technology standpoint, it's more about good practice. Um, Somebody mentioned to me earlier, is this going to be another Y2K? Um, no, it won't be, because Y2K finished on the 1st of Jan 2000. The problem went away. Things either worked or they didn't. When in fact, they all worked and everyone went, oh, what was all the fuss about? GDPR is here to stay. It's all about good practice, making sure that you know what data you've got, where it sits, why you're keeping it. And the technology side of that is there to enable this. A lot of the data is tied up within technology. Um, it's tied up within databases. It's tied up within email. And therefore, you need to put a proportional IT solution in place that enables you to know where that data is, how to retrieve it, how to delete it. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks. So I think we want to start by I guess kind of leveling the playing field for you all a little bit and saying, you know, what is hype and what is not, what do you really need to be concerned about? And we thought the best way to do that was to say, look, you know, let's just cut through um, some of the things you will have heard. So the first thing to say, um, how many people are concerned about consent? Does, you know, does everyone understand what consent is? Okay, so you previously acquired consent, okay, uh, for something. Do you have to get everyone to re-consent? now that the laws are around. Well, no is the truth, but we'll explore that in more detail. But you do have to be more specific about how you keep data and what its purpose is now. But we'll cover consent in a minute, so I'm just going to run through these and we'll, we'll discuss them uh, more across the group. Um, how many people think they may or should be thinking about employing um, a data officer of any description? Anyone worried about that one? Wow, I'm really glad, actually. Well done, everybody. Because that is one of the ones where everyone thinks, I better employ someone who knows about this stuff. Um, and who thinks they're going to get a massive fine on the 28th of May? Anyone think they're going to get a massive fine? Yeah. <laughs> good. Okay, we can put you. Not one person. Yeah, we've got one. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, done. excellent. So look, I mean, you know, to reassure you at this very early stage, we'll say we'll talk about each of these points uh, in some detail across the panel in a second. It's very unlikely you're going to. This is the purpose of the legislation is. It, it, it's fairly typical of this kind of legislation, isn't it? The impacts, the fines, look punitive, and they look extremely scary when you look at 20 million and 4% of turnover. That looks terrifying until you realise that the light way it's going to be policed is probably a good thing. 
But the second thing is, who's familiar with uh, the 72-hour data breach notification rule? Have you heard of that yet? No, good, okay, we'll cover that as well. Because there are some things you do need to worry about and some things you don't. But it's extremely unlikely that the big fine's gonna drop to the post on day one. Um, oh yes, let's cover this one off, which is why it's kind of, uh, it doesn't matter at all how many employees you have. Irrelevant, okay, just cut through that one, it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. Um, but I think one of the things from our point of view, the reason we've come in uh, to do this today is I've given several seminars now on this um, with me at the front of the room on my own um, in panels like this. And the same questions come up over and over again. And the first set of questions are always these ones. What about consent? What about fines? What about employing a data officer? And I think it's really important that you realise that however big you are, you must respond, but you must respond in a way that's intelligent and relevant to you. So what I'm saying is, yes, of course, follow the legislation. But as long as you're doing all reasonable things, I don't think anyone in the room is gonna to have too much trouble. And I want to point out that this is, the sky is not gonna fall in on you all, okay? That's the most important thing to say, to reassure you. Okay, so let's pick up on these points and, and do some detail around them as well. And as usual, I'm gonna get the legal view. Um, Reconsenting, Chris, a massive, a massive concern to a lot of people, this thing about consent. Talk to us about what consent is and what it means. Sure. Um so it, it is one of the biggest changes on the GDPR. Um, so consent is becoming a lot more difficult. Um, what, what does that mean? Well, there's no no longer can you have kind of opt out boxes with one small exception. It has to be an opt in consent, and you just have to be a bit more transparent in the, the wording that you're using. Um, however, um, there's a lot of people saying, well, well, this means we've got to go out and reconsent our entire marketing database. If you are contacting your own customers, there is an exception that's not going away. Um, so uh, that, that electronic marketing exception is covered by this completely separate piece of legislation which isn't changing. Um, so as long as you meet the conditions for that exception, you don't need to be going out and reconsenting your entire marketing database. The, the, where it will change perhaps is um, kind of third party list providers, so people who are selling marketing lists. Um, that, that's going to become a lot more difficult um, because the consents now have to name the person that you're, you're giving the list to. Um, but when we come to lawful basis in a minute, I'll run through those conditions. And if, if you meet those um, in respect of your electronic marketing, you don't need to be going out and reading something. Okay. Stuart, have you got a view? Of course you may. Yeah, so, hello? Okay. Yeah, so if that's a list of, I don't know, 5,000 and only 100 of those are customers, what about the other 4,900? Uh, do you have to get those people to It depends to opt? if your consent is already compliant. Um, so for the 100 that are your existing customers and if you comply with the, the, the conditions on the exception, you don't need to reconsent those. The other 4,900, um, it depends what your current consent looks like. Um, so if it complies with GDPR now, I, it's an opt-in and it's it's relatively transparent, then you won't have to go out and reconsent. You would only have to reconsent if it doesn't already meet the requirements. Sorry, how, how will we know whether we're currently compliant though, if we've already got that consent? I would say first port of call would be the ICA's website. Yeah. Um, they've got some really good guidance on there on what a compliant consent looks like. They have got some draft consent guidance out as well, which was published last year. Um, apparently, what the word is, they got a snap on the wrist from the European um, body for publishing that too early, so they haven't published the final version yet. Uh, but it's a really useful document, and it does give you some very clear steps on what a compliant consent looks like. ICO, yeah, yes, that's which right. is the regulator for the UK. If you just Google um, ICO GDPR consent guidance, the draft guidance should come up. Anyone got any more questions about that? We thought that one might come up. Is there anyone got any further concerns we need to address that? Uh, gentleman at the back, one second, let me get to you so everyone can hear you answer the question. I've always wanted to do this. <laughs> you keep me fit. There we go. Thank you. Um, we occasionally take credit card payments over the phone. And some time ago, thinking of this, we changed the system so we have a pause facility on the phone system now where <coughs> excuse me we ask the customer if it's okay if we pause the call recording take his credit card details then put it back on so we've got his consent to do that but 
somebody the other day tried to sell us a new system saying that wasn't going to be good enough because it was relying on our telephone operator actually pressing the pause button. Would that be correct or not? Um, not strictly speaking. I mean, going back to what, what you do has to be proportionate. I mean, I'm sure these guys could speak more to this, but the, um, what, what you do IT security wise has to be proportionate to your risk. Um, so some businesses it might be that you know your, your banks and the big insurers may have to improve what they're doing. Yeah. Um, some are looking at uh, what's called DTMF, dial tone masking, um, which basically when they key in the, the, the card digit, it masks it, so it gets, goes and basically buzz on the recording. Yeah, they ask the remote person to press on their keypad. Yeah, that's yeah. Really um, it is. Yeah, exactly. And, and, I, and I think, you know, my response to that as a, as a senior person here, and I'll get a technology response and say I'm a technologist ultimately as well, but as if you have a process in place that requires people handling those calls, to pause call recording, you're not collecting the data, are you? Yeah. So therefore, there is no data to be subject to GDPR because you're not collecting the data. So it's a process thing. And if you could say, here's my process, this is what we're required to do when we're handling those kind of calls, I think you'd be good to go. I don't think there's any need to put a new technology system in. I think this is some of the things that, 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 are, that start to, annoy is the wrong word, but frustrates me about technology providers coming in and trying to hit you on a, on a subject matter they know they've got your attention on and they're giving you the correct information because yes, you, you, you don't want to be taking the last three digits off the back of a customer's credit card and recording those on a voice system of any kind because then that data is subject to GDPR. And actually, a second thing comes in, that's the, the relevance of the data. You're only allowed to keep those three digits for the time it takes to process that transaction as well because it's about the relevance of the data to the transaction <coughs> with the customer. So there's no, there would be no requirement to keep that information, and you'd be breaking, you know, several other regulations as well. But Charlie, technology, you know, come on, what, what, what are the technologists doing this time around now? Well, so, so I do think that uh, there are some unscrupulous technology vendors who are using it as an excuse to sell technology. I think primarily you have to think about this exercise as a process and policy piece that is underpinned by technology, and therefore, if you can define why you need the data, how long you're going to keep it, and how you're going to protect it. Once you've got those elements in place, then you can decide what technologies can help you achieve those parts of process and policy. And that's where, that's where the, so primarily process, policy, and then technology. There's, there's nothing more to it than that. Yeah, I agree. So that kind of marries up with my view on, you know, there's a process there, isn't there, that you can define. It's perfectly acceptable to do that if you're not recording the data. The data doesn't exist, therefore, how can it be subject to anything if it doesn't exist? If one of our employees picks up the record call and records, yes. double playback, that has been yes. strongly reduced. Yes. You need to take that. Um, <laughs> that's a legal question. It, it, I can't it depends what happened with it afterwards. Um, so the, the, the breach reporting obligation only kicks in for a security breach. Um, so if it was a case that the operator had the notepad out and they wrote it down and took a list off at the end of the day and there was a um, credit card fraud, then yes, it would be reportable. Um, if it was just a case that they forgot to hit pause and it ended up getting recorded and it's stored up in your your backup somewhere, that's not a security instance, so it wouldn't be reported. Out of interest, where does the call recording go to? Is it, is it a, um, a storage-based system of some description? So it's digital, is it? Yeah, but digital though, it's not an analog system, so it's not, no tape is running, it's, no, no okay, okay, fine. And obviously, obviously if, you, if that storage system ever got hacked, um, and those call recordings leaked out, then it would become a much more serious security breach. Um, so you would certainly want to go out and scrub it back out um, afterwards, just to mitigate the risk. Yeah. Okay. How about general calls that are recorded for training purposes? <laughs> Don't we all love those? Policy. Training and policy purposes. Okay. Um, it depends on what you're discussing. I, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, clearly, at the point where you're having a conversation that includes personal identifiable information with me, then. You know, my bank, for example, asks me lots of personal information when they want to verify that it's me, don't they? So I think it comes back to the kind of information, the kind of exchange. Again, a legal question for Chris as well. Oh, do you want to, do you want to take well, it, John? Well, yeah, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? Well, so my view on this, and maybe Chris can back me up, is that, again, if you're writing a, a policy and a process that says that you're going to be talking to customers and it's going to be recorded in your in your 
telephone recording system and it's going to be kept for X number of years for training purposes as long as it is deleted within that time frame and as long as there is no breach and as long as it's written down as to why you're having those conversations then I believe that that's compliant. Yeah, so essentially there's two, two very basic things you need to process personal data and that's uh, one, a purpose, a reason for doing it and two, a legal basis which we'll come on to in a minute. Um, consent, for instance, is an example of a legal basis but it's not the only one. Um, generally speaking, for, for what you're talking about, there's a, um, a legal basis called um, legitimate interests. So essentially, you've got your business interests on one hand and the impact on the individual on the other, and it's a balancing act, making sure that what you're doing doesn't have a disproportionate impact on them. Um, so as long as you can um, document a legitimate interest assessment and you're, you're happy that that stands, then that's, that's lawful. Um, if you're talking about sensitive things, that becomes a bit more difficult. Um, because legitimate interest, and as we come on to, when it's sensitive data, uh, legitimate interest isn't a lawful basis for sensitive data. Um, so really, that, that does limit your options, and you're probably having to look at consent, or possibly, if you're regulated by the FCA, for instance, you might have an obligation to keep certain call recording. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. Can I ask a question? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to start with technology on that and then we'll move on to legal because the technology point you're asking there are mechanisms which you can deploy to personal phones actually as well if you wanted to but Charlie you take that so um, again it's where you're storing this data so data held on personal phones you can put in some mobile device management technology that allows your phones to be secured effectively and remotely wiped if the, the device were to go missing. Clearly with a lot of your centralized systems, your CRM, your email system, then a lot of that data will be stored centrally on those anyway. It's only if you're storing data specifically on the mobile phone that you should be concerned. But as long as you've got a mobile device management or a process in place that ensures that those devices are locked down, then you will be broadly compli compliant. So, so for the hard, hard copy side, I'll let Chris answer that. Sure. Um, so there's, there's nothing wrong with keeping hard copies um, as, long as, as long as you have the correct kind of procedure and security around it, that's absolutely fine. Um, what I would say is that um, hard copies will only be caught by GDPR if they are um, in a structured format, so if you can search them in some way. It could be as simple as just having a Rolodex. Um, I think it's still quite broad. Um, but th there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. If they're in a filing cabinet, and the filing cabinet is locked, is that sufficient security? It depends how sensitive it is. Um, you would have to basically take the decision as to whether, whether that's enough. Um, yeah. I mean, if it's very sensitive, then... I mean, you might appreciate it's not as sensitive as having sort of um, credit cards in place, but it is sensitive in, in fact, all their personal information, yeah. and all their background, uh, where they've been, mm. you know, Um, probably, probably not. Um, it depends. If you if you've relied on consent mm -hmm. traditionally, 
um, and your concerns not compliant, then yes. Um, but the ICO have kind of given everyone a let, um, so that if you've relied on consent, but now you want to justify it on legitimate interest, for instance, you can do that. Um, what they won't let you do is in two years' time change your mind after they've come and said, no, your, your consent's not compliant. So they've kind of given a bit, people a bit of an amnesty. Um, but chances are, if you have a legitimate reason for doing it, um, consent's probably not your go-to. Um, so for instance, if you are doing DBS checks for safeguarding requirements, so, so they're working with children, <coughs> then there's a legal obligation to be doing that. Um, and so that's, that's your better, that, that's what you should be relying on, not consent. So just to be clear on the, on the phone and technology comment that Charlie made, um, MDM, mobile device management, is relatively inexpensive um, to deploy mobile device management. What it gives you the ability to do is to control personal devices, but only your portion of them. So you're not stopping people taking pictures of their kids and you know doing all of that stuff on their personal device. But for work-related data, it gives you, as Charlie said, the ability to do two things. One, to ring cleanse it, so to put a work um, perimeter around that so the data can't be copied out elsewhere, and also the ability to delete it, whether that's whether the person is still there, whether the person is remote, doesn't matter, you can delete it in either of those cases. So it's kind of an input, if you're allowing personal phone use, it might well be something you want to think about, probably more than whether you've got a stack full of paper files sitting in the office. Um, because that's a very easy way to, for data to get in and out of any organization these days. Just a quick question. Yes. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, so, just um, from my background, obviously, um, software asset management is kind of process governance. And we talked about policies and we talked about processes. Um, I think, I don't know if you guys agree or not, I think it's also important that we measure are the policies effective? Do the processes support that? And effectively, a testing bed to ensure that what, what you, the policy dictates what you're saying your end users and, and how you do, how you document data and store it. The processes support that, but also making sure that they're effective, that they are supporting that policy and you are compliant. So it's probably that, that kind of almost like a DR test style thing to make sure that it does stand up to, to the, the areas you're putting in place. Yeah, thank you, sir. I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna dig too deeply into the Chief Data Officer conversation because none of you guys thought you had to go and get one. Um, I think according to the Owen Mitchell report that, that's here, I think about 19% of companies felt, smaller companies as well, that have no requirement to do large-scale data processing felt that they should employ a chief data officer. And there is no need to do that if you're not effectively data processing for a living. If you're doing, you know, if, if you are one of those kind of organisations, then of course <laughs> we advise you to, to look at that and you're of sufficient scale. But a chief data officer is a very expensive thing to acquire for a small business and totally unnecessary in my opinion as a senior leader. Um, CDOs, as I say, if you're a data processor and all you do all day long is process a huge amounts of information about your customers, then fine. Um, but I think that's one of the popular myths. I'm glad this room hasn't been bitten by that bug. There is no need. You can all cancel your recruitment programs for CDOs if you have them, because you probably don't need them. Um, okay, right, let's, let's move on. Um, right, so, now this is, the, these are the, actually these are the, probably the four things that you need to, to have a good grip on, okay? So is this best coming from you, Chris, or? Yeah, it probably is. Let's just talk about what these things mean, and then you can have uh, a clear view, and you can ask any questions you want to. Sure, um, so we, we briefly touched on personal data. Yeah. Essentially, it's gonna be anything electronic, um, and anything, uh, sorry, related to a living individual, I should say. So um, if they're dead, it's not personal data. Um, so it's anything, about an individual that could identify an individual that's held electronically or it's held in a paper format in a structured way, which is what we touched on before. Um, hey Chris, sorry, just to touch on that very quickly, uh, CCTV? Uh, yeah, absolutely, that's personal yeah. data. Just um, mentioned that one. 
Sometimes it's treated as sensitive plasma beta um, because of you know, biometrics. Um, it could reveal racial um, or ethnic origin, etc. cetera. Um, but generally speaking, it will just be ordinary plasma beta. Which is a very important thing to think about, by the way. The reason I'm very passionate about that is because I'm delivering a solution around video analysis at the moment as part of my role. And video, you know, people, uh, we're all concerned about credit card information and my address and my date of birth. And But actually, if you're recording me walking up to your premises, mm -hmm. I can also ask you to remove me from that as well. Just bear that in mind. I think it was a handsome no, one. No, sorry, yeah, just a quick one. I, I, maybe, uh, what constitutes personal data? Um, so it, it really is anything that identifies an individual or that could identify an individual. And that's the second bit where a lot of people fall down. Um, so there's some really scary statistic about, say, if you have someone's age, postcode, and gender, um, you can identify them with publicly available databases. IP addresses, and stuff like IP that. addresses yes. would be, yeah. yeah. And cookies, tracking cookies, yeah. also considered yeah. that. By the way, that is a really important point, uh, and thank you for that question. So um, I think a little while ago, no, nothing to do with, with GDPR uh, specifically, but for other information protection legislation, Google were asked if they could identify individuals um, using their search engine, and their initial response was, no, we can't closely followed by actually we said no but we, we mean yes we can um, <clears throat> so you know combinations of the internet and tracking cookies and small snippets of personalized information now so I work in the field of AI as part of artificial intelligence as part of my role uh, as chief information officer uh, and chief innovation officer at SCC that some of the things that are possible now are amazingly frightening and scary but the good news is uh, some of these things are incredibly good at finding patterns in things and that's what the people like Google and Amazon all use it all day every day so if you think you've got problems you should try being with them right now they've got the dreams of avarice is worth of problems with all the technology they deploy to know who you are and what you like to spend your money on anyway sorry carry on carry on right. Chris. Um, there's kind of a subcategory of plasma data which we've touched on a few times and that's sensitive plasma data um, um, essentially it's anything that you uh, as a rule of thumb if you think it could, could cause discrimination that's probably sensitive plasma data but it is defined by a list of data, so things like trade union membership, sexual orientation, medical data, uh, biometrics, that kind of thing. Um, the difference being sensitive plasma data, you have to be a bit more rigorous around security, etc. Um, and then also, as I've touched on before, there's different legal bases for sensitive data, so it's harder to justify um, as much narrower set of circumstances which you can process it. Oh, sorry, missed that. So, yes, yeah, so a company email address that's, say, for instance, chris.bridges at erwinmitchell.com, that is personal data in itself. Then it wouldn't be personal data as, yeah. as long as it wasn't actually, so say, for instance, everyone knew that InfoApp went to one person and they had it in their address book, then it probably would be personal data. But generally speaking, uh, um, it's unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> generally speaking, if you have an info app that goes to, like, I don't know, several call center operators. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But what I would say is the risk is much lower. Um, so the ICO isn't that, I wouldn't say it, it doesn't care about, but it isn't so concerned about B2B. Um, if, for instance, you were spamming people and they asked you to stop and you just kept doing it, then the ICO would probably care. Um, but otherwise, um, it, I would say it's lower risk. Um, I've got another question, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, 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 the overall obligation is that you can only keep personal data for as long as it's necessary for the purpose that you have it. Uh, in most cases, that probably means you should be deleting emails at some point. Um, these guys can probably talk yeah. a bit more. So the answer to that question, quite simply, is just for your own sanity, probably deleting some of the old email is, is probably a good idea. Um, but yeah, fundamentally, you know, referring back to what Chris said and what we kind of said at the outset, you know, the idea is that you, so then, and this is one of the things I think is fascinating about GDPR, I'm gonna come on to this now because you've asked the question. It's about people's concern around deletion. Deletion is a really important factor in what you do with the data because you are only allowed to keep it, you should only keep it for the period for which it was purposed, right? That's the whole idea of it. So having an email archive thinking, well, I can prove all of that stuff because I've got 10 years worth of email is, is not the way to go, definitely not the way to go. And obviously, with all of that data, you're also adding cost, not only to your IT system, but also to the cost of 
any requests to forget me uh, and lots and lots of other things. So my advice is there's two ways you can approach email. I get Charlie to respond, but there's two ways you can approach. You can have a rigorous deletion policy, but that will be based on how you as a business operate, and I don't know that. So I can't tell you a period of time that that would be pertinent to do. What I can tell you is if, let's say, every year if you have an annual business and the same business runs through your business every year because it's a cyclical business in that sense, then every year you could take a very long, hard look at getting rid of the data from last year because there'd be no, no real processing value in keeping it, there's no real business value in keeping it. But the other alternative then, and you need to watch this, is somebody comes along and tries to sell you a thing called a vault to archive all your email to. Yeah, all you're doing there is compounding the problem from a technology standpoint, but I'll get Charlie to comment more on that now to answer your question. Um, I'm, I'll hold, uh, just hold your questions for a second. Um, so, so from a technology perspective, and I, I played this out earlier, you've got to define the policy first as to how long you're going to retain data. That's got to be down at the data nub. So if you decided that you're going to delete email addresses after six years, five years, three years, and what, why the business purpose is that you're doing that, you define that in your policy. You then implement an IT system that enables that to happen. So within your email system, you then implement the policy, hence why IT is the enabler for that. And you can put in systems that will automatically do that. Now, you can do that within your live email system. You can actually do that within your vault. So whilst a vault is uh, an IT guy's way of enabling the longevity of your email in perpetuity, you can still have a vault but have it automatically deleting email after a specific amount of time. And I think that is key here. Define the policy, implement the systems to enable that policy. You both had questions. I will pass that over to my legal friend. <laughs> That's quite unusual, I'd say. Um, the difficulty is, so you, the, there's certain legal bases. One of them is compliance with legal obligation. There's another one to defend claims. There's another one to perform a contract. None of those would probably apply there because um, the, the legal obligation is more about uh, legislation rather than a contract with someone. Um, if you are executing everything as a deed, so um, witnessed, etc., um, then the claim period is 12 years, and then you can justify it to defend legal claims. Um, generally speaking, most um, retention periods for defending legal claims will be six years, um, because that's the, the, the claim period on a, on a standard contract. Um, but, say, you might have to have a conversation with your um, insurer. Um, hopefully, they'll be reviewing that as part of their GDPR and not to worry about anyone. I, I would write your own policy. It doesn't have to be long. Um, so but most people in there, um, so we'll talk about um, documenting, doing a, a data audit and documenting it later. But in that in that document, you'll probably just say one line, this is why we're keeping it for six years, so, um, or however long to defend legal claims. And that's perfectly fine. Can we just work through the rest of those sure. concepts now? Sure. Um, so processing. Um, I don't really understand why we still have this concept. It basically means doing anything in relation to personal data. Um, so just assume that if you're, whether it's storing, um, transferring, whatever it is you're doing with personal data, it'll be covered. Um, data controller, um, you'll hear this a lot. So the data controller is a person that decides how and why, or what, how and why. Um, so they decide what data's used, how it's used, why it's used. Um, the data processor, uh, it's kind of one step removed. Um, so they, the best way to think about it is probably a, a subcontractor for a controller. So they don't have any discretion in how the data is used, other than perhaps technically. Um, they they literally just act on the instructions of a data controller. The difference being a data controller, the whole GDPR applies to them. Data processors, there's very few bits that apply to them, um, which is more than under current legislation. Uh, so under current legislation, the well, the current legislation doesn't apply to data processes, um, although it will 
probably by virtue of the contract anyway. Um, so you can probably tick the past liability down. Um, where it's changing for data processing GDPR, um, they now have direct security obligations. So if you're processing uh, data on behalf of another organization, uh, traditionally you would have only been liable to them, not the regulator. Uh, so from, from May, you will be liable to both the regulator and the controller. And just take the question from the back there. Um, so are they are they generating leads or giving you leads or are you? They are, they are mainly to a database that they own. Uh, they would be a controller in their own right. Um, I think that what that that is going to be something that's going to be quite challenging yeah. um, going forward um, because marketing consents are now going to have to name the third mm. party. Mm. Um, so when they generated that list, they would have to say, "Do you want?" ABC Limited to contact you instead of saying, yeah. do you want similar products and service providers to contact you? Um, so that's going to become more challenging. But yeah, you would both be responsible for, for your compliance. Good. Okay. <coughs> um, so uh, Talk Talk uh, were a uh, kind of second breach in a few years last year, um, were deemed to be unfortunate because actually they'd given a load of data to a third party, I think it was Wipro who then done something with the data that caused the breach. Um, so they were, they were fined, I think, £100,000 by the ICA. I think that kind of feeds into this kind of joint responsibility, which I think will be, become more, more prevalent in, yeah. in GDPR. I think that's a really important point. You can't just blame the other party anymore. <coughs> you can't just say it was them. What did it do? It wasn't me. Yes, question on the flag either. So this will be set by the national legislation when it gets finalised. Um, I think the current in the current draft, I think it's is it 13 or 14? 13. 13. Um, so uh, there, before that, there's certain requirements. They can always give consent. There's, there's certain uh, well, extra safeguards, I guess, that you have to put in place um, if you're collecting consent from a 13-year-old. <coughs> and it, it, one of those things will probably be um, that you need a parent. Okay, yeah, front. <coughs> if you have um, CRM software, but you're also sharing that database with a third party while managing, for example, your direct debit, yes. who's responsible for what? Um, in that circumstance, they're probably a data processor and you're a data controller. Um, strictly speaking, they're only directly liable to the regulator for security <laughs> and record keeping. Um, under your contract, there'll be a very different story, and we'll come on to that later. Yeah. Um, but under GDPR, there's certain things that you have to have in your contract. Um, so you would basically pass your liability down to the processor, and that you kind of have a stick to beat them with then um, to make sure they're compliant. Okay, so we're going to move on. Um, uh, this is kind of an important point we're about to hit, and actually, you beautifully segued for me into that point as well, which is excellent. Thank you. We've touched on some of these things already, but I think it's really important. So this comes back to that understanding, this, this is about doing a kind of you know, analysis of what you actually have, understanding what you have. From that then you can do other things. But understanding where your data is is such an important part of this. Um, and I, I won't name names for very obvious reasons, but working with an organisation um, very, very recently, whose business had actually grown quite significantly, but it had grown through acquisition of lots of other small businesses, and by small I mean very small. And so in that scenario, every time they acquired a new business, they inherited all of whatever the process was that that acquired organization had put in place. And some of those things become quite complicated. So I'm not suggesting that any of you or even some of you maybe have that challenge, but you want to be thinking about this as holistically as you can. So let's start to think about some of the things. We've already mentioned anything centralized, any central database. We've already somebody mentioned CRM earlier on. Clearly, that's a really nice, obvious place. Email also a really obvious place. Also spreadsheets and anywhere else you record data to do what you do. However, some of the things that we've talked about, um, I think we kind of need to, to look at in a little more detail. So um, we've already talked about uh, paper. We've already talked about the internet as other places where you store information. And it's really easy to forget. Um, so the, the customer I just mentioned asked me, 
Well, what, what we used to do in the past in one of our uh, locations is we used to ask people to provide their mobile number so that we could do X and Y. Is that, is that okay? Well, absolutely not okay, no. So there was lots and lots of little process elements as well. So think about where you're processing out either internally to your own people or outside of your organisation as well. And I've already mentioned a couple of other gotchas. Uh, how many of you use CCTV in any way? Anyone? Good, okay, so we already called that one out, but it's a really important one. Video images of people are personal identifiable information. Um, uh, from my perspective then, my challenge um, when I'm thinking about this is, do I know everything? So how many of you have a single supplier for your IT, for example, or even have a supplier for your IT that you rely upon? Significant number of you. Have those people approached you yet? Have you spoken with them about the impact? So this is where I think the challenges of this start to become really important to think about, particularly if they've set systems up for you. I'm gonna get Charlie to comment on this, obviously, because I'm representing the senior view, but if, you know, from my perspective, one of the most important things is to start to look at who's provided you with some of these things, and Charlie will explain more about why that matters so much. So um, key in this process is understanding the, the size of your, what we call the data berg, so you will hold data in a whole plethora of different systems, whether they're on-premise or whether they're with your IT supplier. So that will be structured data, like your CRM system, like other databases you hold, things within databases that are in tables that are easily segmented so you can identify exact fields of data. Then you've got a whole host of unstructured data, if you think about it like email. There's all sorts of personal data potentially flowing around in email at least not the email address, but contents of the email itself. And then you've got all of your file shares, folders of Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, people's pictures, goodness knows what's getting stored on your file servers. It is absolutely key to understand what data you've got sitting out in your data estate. Now, larger organizations have this problem on a vast scale, and they need to deploy discovery tools to determine you know, from an application perspective, it's much simpler. Get out the database schema, work out what fields are there and work out what's sitting there. With your unstructured data, the problem is really quite challenging. And having to go out and do that e-discovery to work out what's out there is a key step in the process that then enables you to write the right policy to justify why you're keeping data. So what, what I would suggest in that regard is seek, look at your IT estate as a whole and then draw a data map of where you believe data sits. I know you'll be talking about that in a little while, but it's really key to understand and find out what's in your data book. Okay, let's um, decomplicate a couple of things that Charlie said. Um, go on, yes, you can. what you're capturing in that video imagery I would suggest um, things like number plates are they are these road vehicles or are they no, track vehicles track they're track vehicles so you've got them I mean theoretically if you were to ask one of the top motor GP or Grand Prix teams if their logos were identifiable on their cars for a given season they'd probably say yes which team but which in the which driver okay so it's, it's written on the physical thing but how long do you keep that data for once you've decided who won then that seems to be, you know, a very straightforward, if that's what's required of you, then there's a reason, a legitimate reason why you'd be doing that, provided you have a process that after that period of time you delete the data, would be my take on it. Cool. Yeah, exactly right. Um, um, you, chances are it would be legitimate interest processing, yep. so you have a very legitimate reason for doing it. It doesn't have a disproportionate impact, I mean, it should be quite a straightforward um, one to justify. So for me, the last point on this is, um, I think this, once you've identified what systems you think you have and maybe you've brought your suppliers in to help you with that, I think the most important thing is um, to ask yourself a few questions, um, particularly with 
regard to GDPR kind of giving you the opportunity to rethink it. So you ask yourself, why have you got the system you've got? Why do we use what you know? What is this for? Because it's a great opportunity to say, why have we got one of these? What do we do with it? Who's got access to it? So in other words, evaluate the value of it to you before you decide you have to keep it and make it subject to lots and lots of um, process and other technology things. That's a really important thing, is to understand whether you actually need it. So it's a good time to think about consolidation. If you were thinking about, I don't know, going to a cloud-based service, for example, now's a really good time to start thinking about what that means to you, yes? So yeah, sure. Same, same, difference. same difference, yeah. Same difference. Their, respons yeah, their responsibility wouldn't be content, their responsibility would be to protect you from breaches of that yeah. data from their yeah. systems. But yes, they would have they would have to do they have the same notification as anybody else has. They're not they're not um, able to Well, um uh, yeah, um, so my understanding yeah. <laughs> Which one? Uh, uh, um, one I'd poke him in the head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you might be able to correct me here, but my understanding and why a lot of corporates suddenly went, no one can use Dropbox anymore because the free version of a lot of those uh, file sharing systems, the IP ret is retained by Dropbox unless you pay for a professional version. Dropbox business. Which is yeah. why, yeah, yeah, okay, so that's, that was my intake of breath. And that's um, true of a lot of those free pieces of software. Exactly, yeah. um, I discovered something really utterly amazing the other day. Has anyone got the London Tube Map app? Yeah. Anyone got that? Mm -hmm. um, there are a few others as well. Do you know what the, the secondary part of that app is actually looking at where you are and what you're doing? Did you know that? As part of the freeness of that, it's looking at where you are. Yeah, utterly terrifying. And perfectly legal as well. Just a quick thing on, on, on the data. So we've, I've been working with customers, not necessarily within the guise of GDPR, but certainly some of the financial services customers who actually, if you know where your data is and even if it's structured or unstructured, you've got a place to start, but a lot of data might reside on old assets that are in cupboards or just in who knows where. So they were quite keen to do a kind of amnesty and, and trawl through cupboards to make sure that the data on there, probably in older devices where it's not necessarily backed up and certainly if it's not connected to the network, it's not backed up is find those assets and dispose of them securely if they're not needed anymore and then at least you've got a better coverage because if those laptops I mean we talk about you know the laptops that got lost from various organizations on tubes and taxis and pubs probably um, and what that data what the impact of that data breach could have meant um, again it's, it's just making sure that that, that policy and, and process is in place as well Okay, which brings us on very nicely to, um, I guess, the writing it down um, documentation side of things. Um, so it's very different um, what you actually have to record depending on whether you're a controller or a processor, so that's the first thing to say. But again, as far as I'm concerned, and I think we probably take legal guidance first of all on, you know, on how documentation um, and how critical documentation is. Chris, if you can. Yeah, sure. Um, so there is a, this is required uh, for any organization that has 250 more employees. What we're generally telling clients, you should be doing it anyway, um, regardless of whether you're required to or not. Um, the reason being that GDPR very much shifts the burden onto you to prove that you're compliant. So it's kind of like FCA regulation. Uh, it's not only do you have to be compliant, you have to be able to evidence how you've got there. Uh, and this is the best way to do it. Um, the ICO had really good templates for this. It doesn't need to be sophisticated. It might be that if you're a big business, you might want to look at something like OneTrust, um, but you don't need it. So um, an Excel sheet can do the same job. Um, it just depends how accessible it is if you've got kind of 20,000 rows. Um, what you, and, and I think actually the, the, the more important bit for us is covered by the next slide. Um, so once you've mapped out all of your data, um, there's a bit of analysis to be done. Um, to figure out what your, your, your legal basis for processing that data, which we'll come on to in a minute. Or are we going to go straight there? Yeah, we're going to go. Okay. okay. Um, so essentially, there's for most private sector organisations, there's going to be three um, 
the what, three or four main legal bases that you'll want to be looking at. Um, this consent is the least favourite. It's really hard to comply with. Avoid it wherever possible. Um, generally, the exceptions for most businesses will be marketing and sensitive data, um, but not necessarily. Um, legitimate interest we've touched on already um, is generally the most flexible. It's not a free ticket. You do have to do a bit of a, uh, an exercise and doing that balancing exercise. Um, there's contractual necessity, which is generally speaking, if you have a contract with a consumer and you need the data to perform that contract with them, it's uh, you're clear. Um, so that's, that's a really good one to rely on. Um, and compliance with a legal obligation. Um, so for instance, so the, the best example of this is payroll records. You're required to keep them for a certain amount of time. Um, under HMRC guidelines. Uh, and then the fifth one, um, which will apply probably to, uh, so for, probably more to professional services providers, for instance, law firms, um, personal data related to the advice they've given if they need to potentially defend a legal claim in the future. Um, so they're going to generally be the most useful ones. They need to go into this record um, and you need to be documenting um, your just justification. Um, so don't not only do that legitimate interest assessment that we talked about or what have you, but actually document your thinking behind it. Um, it doesn't need to be long. It could be a sentence. If you're doing something wacky and wonderful, it may be a whole label page. Um, but generally speaking, for most businesses, it will be one or two lines. Um, when you come to sensitive personal data, it gets a bit more difficult. Um, so sensitive personal data uh, th those legal bases become a lot narrower. Uh, consent still there, um, which is generally quite flexible. Um, you can essentially do anything with consent, um, apart, apart from in relation to employee data, um, which where, where consent will then never be possible. Um, the other kind of useful <coughs> ones for most organisations for sensitive personal data will be uh, compliance with an employment law obligation or to defend a legal claim. Um, there's certain others that are relevant to specific industries. Uh, so for instance, medical data if you, uh, in the context of a GP practice, for instance. Um, but generally, it's much harder to process sensitive personal data, um, so you can't rely on legitimate interest or contractual necessity there. Um, so yeah. Special category of exemptions, and obviously um, legal data information about criminal records, for example, is exempt. And that's just yeah, that's just correct. It, in some circumstances, yes. Yeah, explain that. Um, it's all. It's all. Uh, this is all governed by the um, the the data protection bill that hasn't been finalised yet. Um, so it's all in limbo. Uh, generally, criminal record data under UK law is going to be treated the same as sensitive personal data. Um, that's the way it's going at the moment, which is how it was before. Um, that does mean, for for instance, um, DBS checks, you still need to have a legal basis for doing them. Um, but they will be one of the, the sensitive um, or special categories of data, legal bases, not the standard ones. Uh, so it's coming towards the end of its second reading. Um, so well, I'd, I guess I'd say probably around May as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> Data protection bill is basically Brexit proofing GDPR, um, so it, it um, copies it into UK law by reference and then kind of amends it uh, to make make it make sense with. So will the ICO act on the data protection bill or GDPR? Uh, the bill, um, but the bill includes GDPR, um, so it's 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 adds an, it, uh, best way to think about it. It's like an extra layer of the onion around GDPR, um, and it introduces some exceptions. Um, it. Brexit proves it, and that's right. essentially so the two main purposes. Would be reading up more on the data protection bill than on GDPR? Um, I would wait until it's finalised, because at the moment it's horrifically difficult to read. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is horrible. It's, it's really badly drafted, but hopefully by the time it gets finalised, it will. Um, now, it when a lawyer says it's really difficult yeah. to read, <laughs> <laughs> it's not like bedtime reading then for Chris. Yeah, that, no, no, it's okay. not. No. <laughs> okay, any other questions on any of the things that we've just discussed. Okay, good. So I'm gonna move on um, to, I, I guess, you know, telling people. And there are several key things here which I, I, I kind of just wanna throw out there. Um, so 
most important thing is, is who you are and how can I get hold of you, right? That sounds fair, doesn't it? If you've got access to my personal place. So also why you're processing the data um, and on what basis you're processing it, okay? Um, who else also gets access to the data? Really important. Um, if you're intending for any reason to send the data abroad, um, how long you'll keep it, and that's come up several times, right? So again, appropriate length of time to the reasons that you are having access to the data, or you can keep it for an appropriate amount of time. Um, you also need to let people know what their rights are. So how many people today have kind of got anywhere with thinking about all of those, those really important elements? And then finally, um, and this is the one for <coughs> um, the customer service guys in the room, how to complain. How do I not be happy? All things that you need to think about. Would it help? Um, so obviously these, these are not on um, the main slides, but can we make Harry the, the deck available in a shortened version? Yeah. yeah. So well, before you leave, how are we going to do this? If somebody, if you want to let Harry know um, that you'd like a copy of the deck, and then we'll make it available well, somewhere. Yeah, we have. So we'll I'll get that. Yeah, okay. To everybody. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> we now. You, yeah, you stole my joke now. <laughs> Just going for the consent joke there, but never mind, thank you. Yeah, we have consent. And we've, we're, we're videoing you as well, so we've definitely... Right, so, right. Oh, there's a question. Sorry. Do you have any kind of scenarios that you could relate it to so that we can all get a feeling for, say, a gold standard medium sized company? Oh, this is a question. Just so that we get the overview, because this is all... Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Yeah. Is this specifically on the this this Just slide? Or? It's more of the general consent, what we can do, what we can't do. Fine. Obviously, process. Uh, it's a bit of a how long's piece of string. Um, can I ask a couple of specific questions on that for my modest home gym? Mm -hmm. Say the healer just give me a business card after May. You should give me permission to send an email. So this is, this is, yeah, this is a, a hope for Before you actually go out, I've also done a lot of work on LinkedIn, so say you and I connected on LinkedIn after this, LinkedIn, and then yeah. you say, I've now got your email address and your phone number, <coughs> and I can then download that until CSV follows my database and then send you an email. Is that okay? okay. Um, so for marketing generally, um, the, well, if it's electronic marketing, the general, and this isn't a GDPR thing, it's always been the case that you need explicit consent. Um, or opt-in consent. Um, implied consent is still possible under GDPR, um, except where it's sensitive personal data. So if, a, if you've got a bowl uh, with a notice that's saying, you know, drop your business card in and we'll send you uh, our newsletter, that's fine, that's the consent. The, the difficulty is how have you evidenced that consent, which is another new requirement under GDPR. Um, well, I record that in my CRM system, so I'll go home, I'll, I'll, I'll scan that, I'll put it in my CRM system, I'll say I'm going to say that the GDPR reason is consent, so if anybody asks me where you get that from, just keep mentioning it. Um, I've got Sarah denies it though. Yeah, I mean, I will, we'll see how this pans out. Um, we, we just don't know at the moment. As long as you've got a process around evidencing it, the ICO could come and say, no, we don't agree, but they'll just tell you to stop doing it. They're not going to fine you as long as you tried, um, you tried your best. <laughs> um, LinkedIn, it's no different from, um, say, say you've got a supplier database, just because you have their email address because you need it to I don't know, send them instant notifications, that doesn't mean you can send your marketing to them. Um, what I would say is the, the electronic communications regulations, the, 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 the separate piece of legislation at the moment doesn't apply to corporate subscribers, which <coughs> in, in, is basically B2B marketing. Um, so at the moment it's probably lower risk. Um, there, there is a new draft coming um, next. Well, a new regulation coming that's currently in draft. Um, that looks like it may extend that to corporate subscribers. So the, the general will be on. Is that a yes and no or a maybe? It's a maybe. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, at the moment it's a B2B right. marketing is very low risk, but next year it could change. Basically. So what? Be, 
so I was going to answer the lady's question, actually, or try to answer the lady's question with a simple example, actually, yeah. of some of the things that, that you could do. So um, let, me, let me just talk about a specific customer. I think you've been involved in the same customer, Charlie, so I'll get you to augment some of the things I'm saying. So I think Charlie's kind of touched on the very simple basis of this already, I think, in quite eloquently. I think for most people, the first position is to understand, so just to find out what you don't know, okay? Uh, what I mean by that is, we typically would, from a technology perspective, okay, so let's talk about, you're using computer systems in your business, yes? Extensively? Okay. So the first thing uh, that we would do is to engage in you know, an, an audit effectively to understand what you've got. And most legal organizations who would also offer to support that would do a very, very similar thing. Once we've delivered that, then you can understand what your exposure is. So effectively producing a gap analysis is the first step. So we know where all your data is, we know what your exposure is. And then the second part of it is to understand um, how your business uses that information. Okay, so what your processes are. And then fundamentally, the resultant of that will tell you where you have things that you should not have from a legal standpoint. And we can remediate. So we want to talk very, can we talk about a customer in reasonable detail? Because they're a good example. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can we talk about <laughs> We're going for consent here. <laughs> yeah, we can, can we? Cool. So, so this particular organisation had done a, I'm not going to say anything about them that could identify them. Um, so they had done a gap analysis with their legal organisation and that had identified a lot of gaps from a legal standpoint. Um, as an IT organisation, we went in to help them about uh, certain elements of the process. So that's the discovery element, which data what data do you have sitting where it was a it's an organization that has multiple sites around the uk uh, and has grown through acquisition so they've got lots of different email systems lots of different databases knocking about they wanted to consolidate um, this was a huge opportunity for them to expedite that process to enable them to get down to a single single bunch of systems if you like so we helped them with the discovery using some automated tools that looked at both their database structure, um, but also their email and file areas. Um, we then also looked at it more programmatically about their general security. So um, I'm going to come on to this in a bit more detail with a slide at the end, but just to cover it off at a very high level, clearly once you've identified the data and where it sits, you then need to put adequate provision in to secure it whether that's using encryption, whether that's making that your network is secure. So you're, you're protecting the data whilst it's sedentary and also in transit. So you need to make sure that that end-to-end -end security is in place. Then there are other aspects that we help them with. This was once the data is sat there, how do you monitor your systems to make sure that if there is a breach, that you can notify the ICO within the designated 72 hours. 72 hours isn't a long amount of time, and I know we may be covering this in a bit, but um, 72 hours was never, never the mandate under general data protection, uh, and we have um, clearly been able, as some areas around TalkTalk, Talk, for example, brush things under the carpet for an awful long time, and it's only when things get into the public domain do things suddenly become clear. You're going to interrupt me, aren't you? Just a touch, yes. <laughs> um, um, it was just interesting, um, for the, the Equifax breach that happened pr primarily in the States, but actually affected about 160 million uh, users. Um, two things, well, the really worrying thing is Equifax are kind of the same experience. They, they hold all of your data for everything you've ever, every, every time you've ever applied for a loan or anything like that, they'll keep that data. That's obviously the worrying thing. Um, to say they dealt with it quite badly is a bit of an understatement. Um, uh, I think the SEC and the States are still investigating four fairly senior executives that sold approximately $2 million worth of shares before the announcement was made. And they claim that they didn't know this had happened, even though one of them was a CFO. Um, so that's a bit of an eye raise. And then again, back to the talk talk, I think this is about, this element of GDPR is about making sure there's corporate responsibility for those, especially those big, big breaches like 
you know, Yahoo and, 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 and all, of, all the ones that have happened over the last few years have kind of sat on it. I mean, Yahoo sat on the extent of their breach for about five years. Um, and then obviously Talk Talk didn't, because clearly I guess they want to get their house in order before they have to manage bad news and all the rest of it. But again, um, and Equifax made it even worse by putting a uh, stupidly clonable uh, website for people to go on and effectively um, rebadge them or kind of get some recompense and some protection of which someone else was able to clone that website because it wasn't under the Equifax.com domain. So all in all, it was a bit of a disaster. And that, and that came from an unpatched piece of open source software that the patch was available two months earlier when Equifax pointed the finger and said, oh, it's their fault. They said, no, it isn't. We patched this two months ago. You just didn't bother um, updating it. So there's a whole element of that 72 hours thing is, is as you say, not very long. But I think if you look at the, the ills of the past, and clearly the, these are, are the big companies and probably less 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 impactful than perhaps some of your, your, your businesses. But that's, I think, part of the reason they, they put that in there, to get the message out quickly people can make some some provision to, to how they deal with that breach can we just jump to the last slide very quickly because just no, no, we will come back to the other ones you don't get away with it um, just yeah 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 Here's that. yeah so uh, you didn't put the graphic in very well did you but hey don't worry about it um, so so I, I think this this wheel of fortune says the process from end to end quite clearly uh, and draws out some of the elements where you need to get your IT house in order. Now clearly all of this is taking reasonable and proportionate um, measures in place to make sure that you are dealing with all of these things so don't take this away as a huge fear factor, oh my god there's a million things for us to do because clearly it is proportionate to the size of the organisation and the, the data you hold. But the four processes to, to achieving GDPR um, compliance from a, an IT perspective are these. So assess on the bottom left hand corner is about doing that data discovery. What data do you have? Where does it sit? Why do people need to access it? What are you going to do about deleting it? So doing that gap analysis, putting those policies and, and standards in place and then very importantly minimising the data. So, reduce your data estate so that you're no longer having those things at risk. Once you've identified that data and you know where it all resides, then you need to protect that data. So access control is clearly one area which we all do on a daily basis. Make sure that you're securing your data with adequate username passwords. There are two interesting phrases here, anonymization and pseudonymization. Pseudonymization is a word that's been reinvented or invented for GDPR, but um, anonymization is clear. It's removing the ability to identify an individual from the data. So if you, you are holding statistical data, for example, and you remove all links to the individual themselves, so Charlie Cornish cannot be identified, because there is no link between Charlie Cornish and said data, then that is anonymization. There will be times, however, where you need to reinflate the data and understand that the data does belong to somebody. So pseudonymization effectively replaces all links to Charlie Cornish with a unidentifiable uh, pseudonym, reference number, whatever you want to call it, but at some point, held in a table elsewhere is the ability to reinflate that data should you need to find out that that data was Charlie Cornish's. The beauty of that is of course that if there is ever a need to anonymize the data you just delete that key and it becomes anonymized. Cyber security, inc uh, encryption, data loss protection, these are all um, technologies that will ensure that your network is being secured that the data is being secured and you are protecting it as an environment as a whole. Then you've got detection. So once you've protected your environment, how are you, how are you detecting of breaches? So you need to have an ongoing audit process. You need to be monitoring your data systems so that you can notify breach detection and notification. You can notify the ICO within 72 hours. 
uh, and there are a whole bunch of technologies that exist out there to help. And I've put a number of enabling partners that we work with that have solutions in these spaces. Last but not lo um, last but not least is response. So once you've identified a breach, how do you deal with that um, breach? How do you prove compliance? If somebody comes to you with a data subject access request, and bearing in mind the rules have changed in this space, so no longer does it cost an individual £10 to ask for their data to either be uh, removed or searched or tell me everything about myself, it is now free. So we will get, I suspect, a rush of frivolous requests asking organisations to please tell me everything you know. You have to prove that you've looked for the data and that you've provided all of the data. Currently, the onus of proof isn't really there. So search and e-discovery is critical to make sure that you can respond. Now, the timelines for response are if somebody asks you for their data, then you have to respond within one month. It is extendable to three. Is that right? In exceptional circumstances. So normally a month. Yeah. Don't know what exceptional circumstances. Took too long to look. Uh, okay, so one month. Bear in mind one month. So from an IT perspective, there are a whole host of things you could do. Now, this is a frightening wheel of fortune. And if you're a small two-person organisation, 20-person organisation, then you need to make sure that you are putting appropriate technical and organisational measures in place. So many of things, these things can be coming back down to this, policies and standards, many of these things can be managed out, potentially, by making sure that you've got a very stringent policy and standard. Any questions on that? Well, so you need to protect the, in the personal data that you're holding on the phone. We talked earlier about mobile device, device management software, that you can manage those devices and that will ensure that that can't happen because effectively it creates a ring fence around your corporate data. So yes, you have to make sure that they can't do that. Absolutely. Well, uh, again, if you, uh, I'll refer actually to, to Chris in terms of that. So I think we covered this off before, but in terms of using personal data and social media interlinked, were you you're talking about specifically via mobile devices? Because that was the, or just generally? I suppose generally mobile, whatever. Wherever it's it sits. I think it, it's how the app, because it asks for access to the contacts. But I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you, you you know exactly what it does when you give access to them. Is it just as and when it might want to just say, oh, here's some people you might know, you you know that aren't connected to you on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever it might be. I don't know if it actually then opens all that up straight away. I don't know if you know that. Uh, I'm not sure. No. Yes, I'm Chris, is there a general is there a general guidance um, around the use of social media and well, mixing it with business? What's on social media is personal data. Um, so you do need to be compliant. I mean, it depends what you're doing. So a LinkedIn message, chances are will be treated the same as an email. Um, if you're pulling data off so social media, you need to have a purpose and a legitimate reason for doing it. Um, so I'd say it's, it, it, well, it, the, the, the same principles apply essentially. Um, there, there's nothing wrong with using social media, but you, you wouldn't need to be able to just, if you're pulling data off or using data mm -hmm. from it uh, for your own purposes, then you, you need to be able to legitimize it. Um, and actually, a, a good example um, in a, 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 so a business use of social media, uh, I think it's the Belgian um, Data Protection Authority has recently, um, what was it, Dutch, I can't remember, um, have uh, had a case in the European Court of Justice um, over who's responsible uh, for Facebook advertising. Um, so this is where you're going in and selecting the demographic. Um, does the uh, essentially, the, 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 the decision was that although the business has no access to the underlying data, 
they are determining the purpose for which the underlying data is used. Um, so it was basically they have to comply as well. They have to have a legitimate reason, a uh, legitimate interest in doing it, for instance, or another another legal basis. Um, so so you do need to be careful with social media. It's not just that you can't pass the buck onto the the social media provider. But the, leg the legitimate interest in recruitment then is just looking for candidates on behalf of our clients. Yeah. Can you give that? Yep, yep, yeah. The, you need to do a, a, an assessment and make sure what the, the, what you're doing is not having a disproportionate impact on them. Um, but yeah, it, it's possible. Um, it gets slightly fuzzy, I, I suppose, when it's a candidate perhaps you've never contacted before and you've got no relationship with them. That is that then the marketing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it must be everything. Yeah, uh, the, the question is, is that then marketing? Um, I don't know the answer to that, to be perfectly honest. Um, the ICO do apply quite a broad definition to marketing. The best thing to do, I'd say, is to ask them. Um, the helpline is really, really useful. I'll speak as a senior person and say that um, I, I don't know how many approaches I get uh, in any That's given week. But it's 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 tens of them every day, um, and we all do, don't we, through social media because it's easy to do. And I think I don't see that as anything other than, you know, um, a minor inconvenience. So from my perspective, I think, you know, you could broadly argue it is marketing, isn't it? Because what you're trying to do is connect a person with a product. Effectively, the fact that product's a job, mm. that certainly be my view. So I wouldn't directly answer your question, although I think it's probably worth looking into how that interaction happens between the app and the data. I don't think... Well, exactly. But I'm sure they'll tell you if you ask them. Or maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> Probably not. So, okay, we're going to start to wrap up. I think, you know, some, there's some really kind of key messages come across. I think, you know, the, the complexity that you're all seeing in this is it's a combination of understanding a legal position and understanding a technology position, and that's actually quite an interesting mixture. So the very first time I came across this conversation was uh, in a large company called Veritas. And uh, Tamsin Evershed is um, their, one of their legal people, retained legal people, and she said the hardest thing about this was it was bringing together a team of policy and legal people with a team of technologists to give the correct answer. So it's a multidisciplinary thing, which is why we've got representatives at the front today from the IT profession and the legal profession. Um, without wanting to overcomplicate it, though, I think there are some simple things that we've talked about today that make absolute sense for you to do. One of those is to understand what you've got. So if you think about that half circle Charlie showed before, understanding what you have is the first thing you need to do. If you need to contact your suppliers, do so to understand what you have. And then it is about effectively questioning what systems you've got, what do you do with them, <clears throat> why do you need them, and how long do you retain the information that sits in them for? These are some simple questions you can ask yourself before you go anywhere near a technologist. There's no need to find you know, a technologist to answer that question. Um, and the bottom line for me, and I think for all of us here, is, you know, and Charlie said this earlier on, it's have a policy about data deletion. I think your question very early on around email was a great example of that. If, if for your purposes it's, it's a seven month window, then every seven months, put measures in place that delete that information. Don't let the IT run away with you. I think, you know, for me, I've been in IT 33 years. IT runs away with people, particularly in small businesses, because, you know, it's relatively cheap now too, isn't it? You know, you can get some great technology for not many pounds. The problem isn't now the fact you have access to that capability. The problem is understanding your access to that capability. And I think from that perspective, that's one of the, the takeaways is the bottom line is you need to have a policy, you need to be able to justify it and don't just keep things because you think it's the right thing to do because technology is terrible for allowing us to keep things. And I think, you know, we all know that from our personal lives. Technology is a great way of keeping things you would never keep any other way because you'd run out of loft space or garage space if it was actual physical possessions. And I think that's a really important element. <clears throat> from my perspective, other things in, you know, other things to consider is how you interact with other people, how you interact with your customers, and what their expectations would be of how you would interact with them. So what I mean by that is, you know, digital isn't always bad. In fact, digital can help you in a lot of ways. Taking stuff from paper-based to digital sounds frightening in some instances, but actually gives you the ability to interrogate the data much more readily, much more quickly, much more easily. But I think for me, that basic process of find out what you don't know today first, 
get your supplier in to help you with that from a technology standpoint if you need to. Take legal advice. Lots of the legal organisations out there are now quite happily willing to come and do an initial assessment. Um, lots of technology companies happy to come and do an initial data assessment. It isn't rocket science. So if the one thing that you took away was that arch, at least what that does is tell you, well, you know, what the process is from a technology standpoint. And then the process from a personal standpoint is a simple understanding of the legislation, how you use personal identifiable data, um, and where you store it, really. And that's the first place to start. Don't panic. Don't go and do crazy stuff. Don't go and agree to sign up to phone systems that block out, you know, people's CVV numbers before you've understood why that matters to you. I think that's the that's the, the, the best advice. Now, as we said at the outset, no one is going to burn you alive on day one. Okay, you have time to understand what you need to do. But if this has given you anything at all, it should have given you the incentive to try and do that when you go back to your workplaces. I'm, I'm going to get a closing statement from everybody now. Chris, takeaways from you. What are the takeaways you give the audience? Um, well, if, I, I suppose if you haven't already, then get that, get that data audit done and document it because without that, if you haven't done that by May, then the ICO will care. Um, the rest of it, as long as you have a roadmap, um, to compliance, and you haven't been grossly negligent, they're, they're, they're not, they're not going to throw the book at you. So. so I think I comply with that. Do something. Don't just do nothing. Stuart? Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see what, what happens post the 25th of May, because um, we had a conversation with someone in the room earlier about, you know, take on the ICO take on 700 people to batter down your doors and demand you evidence your data protection and your GDPR, but that I think that's just the volume of expected demand. It's not all going to be knocking down people's doors. And bear in mind, they're going to be um, covering every organisation from um, you know small um, organisations like most of you here today to obviously the biggest um, organisations in kind of corporate business. So they're going to be looking at, at, at the right appropriate focus. And as we mentioned earlier, it's all appropriate to your business and how you can, can effectively evidence and, and justify you're doing the right thing. So I think that's really yeah. kind of the, the main main right. thing. Have you got any closing comments? I would, I would um, agree with Chris. You know, you need to do the audit and also remember if you get stuck, there are plenty of people out there who can help and advise you. I think we've also pointed you at the ICO website a few times today, some really useful documentation and other advice up there you can get for free, basically, so do that. Yeah. 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 We'll, um, we'll add a slide at the end, just yeah. so there's a reference point. It's already in there, actually. It is, I've checked. That's what I was looking through to find, is whether the links are there. Charlie, closing comments from you? So I would reiterate what uh, the guys have said over there. That is the advice that we're giving customers day in, day out. Put a plan in place, do your data assessment. Um, have a plan and those elements in place for the 25th of May. Um, I would suspect that the ICO is taking on 700 people so that they can interpret the data protection bill by the sounds of it. Um, and use your IT partners as well as your legal counsel to, to help you become compliant. Can I just make one very quick you can. Yes, because that's what I do. <laughs> How did you know? That's amazing. I've only just done that. That's incredible technology you're using at that end of the phone. So look, I think I think the final piece of advice that we're sort of implicitly giving you, but I'm going to give you explicitly now, be wary of GDPR consultants, okay? And I mean that, and I don't mean legal counsel and IT professionals. What I mean is people who claim they can come and fix you, really. Um, I think, you, you know, we, we've suggested where you should get your advice from, and that is, you know, um, legal counsel and you know reputable IT businesses there's no need to, to you know no one's going to come and sweep this into a pile for you unless they're going to charge you a very great deal for it I'll just remind you at the front of the room are the two brochures I mentioned you're more than welcome they explain everything we've said today really simply and if, if, it, if it was kind of you know a one-on-one literally it just repeats everything we've said so even if you didn't take great notes you now did so well done you just by taking a copy of those have you got soft You would, there will be soft copies. Okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> Did you understand what you were consenting to then? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Implied consent. So, look, uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, um, on behalf of uh, the panel, you know, we really appreciate you coming here today. We hope we've given you at least two or three things you didn't know before you walked in the room. 
Um, so if we have informed you, um, my name is Ian Sherratt. Um, if we haven't informed you, it's Peter Smith. And none of that's personally identifiable information. So thank you all for attending today. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.